Let me ask you a question. Should you have a quiet time? If you have a quiet time as a Christian, how long should it be? What time of day should you have it? If you don't have a quiet time in a given day, is your status as a Christian hanging in the balance? Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host. Today on the podcast, I'm back on a subject that I can't seem to get away from, legalism. I want to address not four different forms of legalism as we very recently did. Today, I want to talk more about how the Christian balances what we call structure and freedom. These terms owe to a number of thinkers. Abraham Kuyper uh, works with them in his theological program. Structure and freedom refer to the following. God gives us structure in the Christian life. He sets up the Christian life himself. So we're not self-creating our own Christian journey. God is the one who has created the world. And as the one who has created the world, God is the one who sets things up and sets the terms of our faith in terms of new covenant Christianity. But we don't only live in structure. We don't only live in the system that God has designed, the world that God has made. We also have a second principle, and it's very key. We have freedom. God does not give us only freedom, just said that, but God does give us genuine freedom. He gives us, the new covenant makes clear, the New Testament unfolds, freedom in Jesus. It's so important to understand the second concept because people all around us are looking for freedom. That's very close to the heart of what uh, people most want in this world. They want something that enables them to be free, and they want something that enables them to know pleasure. Of course, though, I can't run ahead of my skis. They also want structure. It's fascinating. Uh, you think about how anarchists gather together. You think about how they will chant together under someone's leading, we will not conform. We will not conform. We, we will not. Do you understand how remarkable that is? That a movement of anarchists would gather and someone would lead them and they would all chant in perfect synchrony the same words? That shows you that in the human heart, there's a desire for freedom, very strong desire. There's also a desire for order, for structure. Uh, we, we have recent examples of this in America. Sadly, a whole bunch of college students out there had their college graduations canceled. Actually, it's the same tragic generation that had their graduations canceled in high school in 2020, and they just had college graduation canceled because of pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas protests. So awful. I covered some of that on grace and truth. So unjust, so evil that college graduation was canceled because of students in America supporting a terrorist organization like Hamas and endangering Jews on campus and making them feel uh, second class as citizens or even worse, so wrong. But even there, you see that instinct for structure, don't you? You, you see the desire to burn things down and support Hamas, uh, again, a wicked organization if there ever was one. But what happened? People came together in organized protests. And uh, some of my favorites along these lines are when the leader, as I was saying a minute ago, says what to say, and uh, the people say it back to the leader, and on it goes. Suffice it to say that the human heart wants both structure and freedom. But you have to keep those things, now I'm speaking uh, in a Christian sense, very much together. If you go too much in one direction, you'll end up in a ditch on either side. If you go on the structure side, all the structure side, which is a very strong compulsion, what you will have are systems of religious control, perhaps even uh, out of a, a Christian backdrop, perhaps even among Christians who are truly born again. But the focus won't be on Jesus at the end of the day, as we talked about in our previous episode. The focus will be on the rules. It will be on the rituals. It will be on us. It will be on our performance. It will be on what we are supposed to do. And, and Christianity, as represented by a church along those lines, for example, will look like control. And as we talked about, the, the air in the room will be tight and parched, and the people will be gloomy and scared and skitterish and unstable. That's what an environment looks like that is ruled by structure. On the other side, an environment that is ruled by only freedom will have no structure and no order, and there will be all 
kinds of unsound things going on, and no one will be speaking into that, and there won't be the grace of shepherding. There won't be any kind of godly authority operating in that context. There's only freedom, and you can definitely find that in the professing Christian world today. It's all over the place. You've got to be really careful here, though. Here's the thing. Among conservative evangelicals, there's been a tendency to look over at the only freedom side and say, that is the chief evil of our time. When in reality, the, the controlling environment actually gets some of the strongest censure in all the New Testament. Because that kind of environment, whatever it starts out in, in terms of motives and desires, ends up in legalism. And legalism, as we talked about, compromises the heart of the gospel, or in a slightly less awful sense, takes all the joy and happiness out of Christianity. Well, there's something better. It's to balance structure and freedom according to the Word of God. I'm not imposing these categories on the Word of God, by the way, as we're going to talk about. These categories, I think, derive whatever terms you use from the Word of God itself. The Word of God, that is, calls us as Christians into a life that is structured but free. It, it, it gives us what the human heart made by God most wants and what the human mind made by God most desires, a balance. Now, when we say balance, we don't mean some kind of squishy, third way, perfectly calibrated between conservative and liberal. That's not what I mean by balance. I'm talking about somebody who is standing upon the word of God. I'm talking about somebody who is born again. I'm talking about somebody who is saved and has decidedly, by the working of God, thrown in their lot with Jesus. I believe that biblical truth puts us in a fundamentally conservative position relative certainly to where our culture is. And so I'm not calling for us to be some sort of weird metamorphosis of conservative and liberal. I don't mean that. In terms of those terms, if I was going to use it, I want people to be squarely conservative, standing on biblical orthodoxy. That is the solid rock before us. But we have a lot of matters uh, that we have to work out in our lives. And sometimes conservative evangelicals, Bible-believing Christians, don't always do justice to just how much gray area there is before us. Let me give some examples. Let, let's think about being a father or a mother. Sometimes you get very structured systems that are presented to you as the way to raise your kids. And there can be real good in those systems. We need order in our homes. There, there are a lot of Christian homes that are only that freedom kind of home. And you, you know, as well as I do, we've talked about this on a recent episode of this podcast, you know what results when there is no structure in a home. There's no order in a good sense. I mean, there's no authority, God given. No, there's only freedom. And you know the chaos that ensues in that home. And you know that really the inmates are running the asylum. And so dad and mom may uh, seem to be on paper the authority in the home, but they're really not. It's the whims and the behavior of children who are controlling and ruling the home. And then as I talked about, that spills over even into church life where those unruly, untrained, disobedient children who are basically running wild throughout their life now get to run wild in a church service. It's not that we, we don't ever think a child should say a, a squeak in a church service. That's not sound as I talked about. But fundamentally, we have to train our children out of love. But that's not happening today. But hey, you can go the other side as well, and you can lock down every single second of your kids' lives in your own life, and in so doing, squelch the freedom they should have, especially as they get older and more mature. Here's a principle that I was uh, handed down by my father-in-law, Dr. Bruce Ware, excellent theologian at Southern Seminary. He, he encouraged um, my wife and I early on with his godly wife to see parenting as not merely structure or freedom, but to train our kids young. And then as they got older, to give them more and more freedom. So they have a base of structure. You know, they, they know what dad and mom expect and they're held to those standards. But then as things go on and they learn to obey, you can give more and more freedom and trust to your kids. That is the opposite of how things sometimes work in Christian homes, where there can be, well, 
varying degrees of structure, let's say maybe a lot of structure or maybe not as much structure when kids are young. And then what happens is you clamp down as they get older. And now you're freaked out by a teenager in the home and they can't do anything or go anywhere because you're terrified of them having freedom. We don't want our kids to have total freedom in the sense that, you know, there's no shepherding in the teenage years or something like that. But we do want to be increasing our trust in them and them experiencing increasing trust from us as they get older and as they mature. And all of this means that we have to tackle a whole range of things that aren't explicitly lined out in the New Testament. What time do our kids go to bed? When do we pray together as a family? Uh, what schooling option do we choose? What do we do for discipline? Um, what do we do for fun as a family? Even just with those few quick questions, you see that there are a lot of matters that aren't explicitly handed down in the word of God. And so that's just one example of an area where Christians have freedom to work out their answers to those questions. We don't do this in a vacuum. We don't say, no, I'm stopping my ears to any wisdom because only the word of God, only what it explicitly says shapes how I will live. No, that's not what the word of God calls for at all. In fact, there's an entire category that we call wisdom in scripture. And and wisdom is in the Bible, whatever the Bible teaches is wisdom, but then you also take what the Bible teaches in terms of principles, and you seek to apply that faithfully to God's glory. And a lot of how you do that, frankly, as a Christian, is through discipleship relationships, where a godly, mature Christian walks through things with a younger, less mature Christian, and ideally doesn't say, this is exactly how to live as a Christian, this is exactly how to be a father or mother, but gives them principles and gives them advice and gives them thoughts and doesn't bind the conscience uh, quickly, but does try to help the younger generation that is less mature figure this whole Christian thing out in a lot of different ways. So that is our first reality. I, I haven't said this already in the podcast. I have four realities for you. Should have said it earlier, but I didn't. Oh, well, there is freedom for me to appropriate the grace that is in uh, God at this very moment because I haven't given you my principles. The first one was this. We have to combine structure and freedom. We have to combine structure and freedom. Second, second principle of four, uh, as we consider uh, how we avoid legalism. How do you avoid legalism? You remember you're living in gospel freedom now. You remember you're living in gospel freedom at this very minute. One of my most cited verses uh, in our time together on this humble podcast, Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's no yoke of man-driven slavery that we are under. There are going to be places in the New Testament where we are called a slave or a servant of Christ, but that is not a burdensome slavery or servanthood. That is a redeemed slavery and servanthood in which we follow our master and our Lord, King Jesus, and he does not lord his authority over us, though he is our absolute, total, and unquestioned authority as Christians. Nonetheless, he is the one who, switching to a different passage, Ephesians 5, nourishes and cherishes his people. He, he is a tender master and Lord, just like God the Father is a kind Father for us. All of this then speaks to how the Christian lives now. We're not living in the slavery we once were in, in an unconverted state where we were responsible for keeping all God's law, and we totally failed in that respect. We are now living as Christians, born again by God's grace, out of the overflow of the finished work of Christ. In back of every minute of our existence is the fact that Christ has made perfect atonement for all our sin, on the cross, Christ has satisfied the wrath of the Father against us. He has cleansed our guilty conscience. He has, he has walked himself in his earthly life in all the ways we could not walk, keeping all the tenets of the law we could not keep. He has proven to be the true Israel, the true Son of God, that is. And so he has succeeded where Old Testament Israel failed. And now, he has, uh, after being resurrected, ascended on high, and is ruling, 
in glory and splendor, in total victory over the forces of darkness. All of that is in back of, but not just in back of, all of that is driving the Christian life now. And all of that means that you and I are living in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Now, freedom of Christ doesn't mean that we don't obey what the New Testament teaches and that we don't learn from all the Bible, because we certainly do. But that freedom of Christ means that we are not to submit to man's regulations and man's law, and even we're not under the the Old Testament law itself. That's what um, Paul says in Galatians 3. 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This is absolutely glorious teaching. We are now all sons. We are no longer under that law. That law is good. Paul makes very clear that God's teaching was good and God's code for living under God was good, but that law did not save. Jesus has saved us, and Jesus now is the master we follow. We don't follow the law as our master. We follow Jesus, the fulfillment of the new covenant as a son of God. Hey, we'll be back to the conversation in just a minute, but I need to talk to you about something very important. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives that leave many feeling voiceless in conversations crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that has never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech. Yes, to free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth protection research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and listeners can get it completely free. Don't you love those words? Completely free. Text IDEAS, one word, IDEAS, to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Again, text IDEAS, just one word, to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas uh, the establishment does not think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. How important is this? Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. Now back to our conversation. So the Christian lives in freedom. We're not trying to keep the law salvifically. We're not the one who is charged with obeying every precept of the Old Testament law. That is what Jesus has done. We, we are not antinomians who have cast off the law and say it's abolished. It's of no use to us. No, we are still instructed by the law. Depending on what you mean, that's the third use of the law, according to Calvin, which we can affirm. Again, has to be rightly uh, uh, parsed and understood. But the, suffice it to say that we are in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Our life now is a freedom to be holy. Our life is a freedom to follow Jesus wherever he calls us to go. So you and I, in terms of the practical experience of our Christian lives, are not walking around with a little rule book, uh, furiously paging through it on a minute by minute basis. What am I supposed to do right now? What am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. I got to do this demand. I got to do that demand. No, we have freedom. Even with what God prescribes for us, even with, for example, Bible reading. We don't have a precise outline for what that has to look like every day we live as a Christian. Many of us read the Bible uh, multiple days a week, hopefully most of the days of the week, um, in the morning. That's my normal practice uh, for reading God's Word. Um, I try to, to get 
get that in before the day starts. I try to read the Word of God and meditate on the Word of God. Uh, and, and so stock myself up with the word of God, hide the word in my heart that I might not sin against God to use the language of the psalmist. Okay, so I believe that's a good and God-honoring practice. But here is what I have seen, honestly, in my own life. I can approach that quite legalistically. I can think I'm justified by my quiet time, honestly. I can think if I if I don't have at least 15 minutes of Bible reading and then hopefully later on in the day, at some point, this is how it often works for me, you know, 20 to 30 minutes of prayer or something like that. I can think that if I don't have some assemblage of those time portions that I'm a bad Christian and God is displeased with me and I, I, I'm... <laughs> My justification is is a little lower now than it could have been if I'd had a better quiet time. I don't know about you, but I think that thinking is very common in the church, much more common than we might like to think. We we should be students of the Word of God. We should be Bereans. But if we're not careful, we can do one of two things. We can go to the Old Testament and act like it is binding upon us when it it is not directly, and we can set up new systems. Uh, created by us or maybe by some other teacher and say, this is what pursuing God looks like in your spiritual disciplines. This is what a quiet time must be. You have a ton of freedom in terms of your pursuit of the Lord. There are wise practices that many will commend to you, and you and I should take those very seriously. But we don't have a specific form given us in Paul's writings, for example, or the Gospels that says your quiet time has to be 30 minutes, your prayer time each day has to be 30 minutes, you have to hit five days a week or six. If you don't, here is all the things that are, that are going to befall you, because this is specifically what faithful Christian living looks like. It is exactly this code. Here again, I think that's how a lot of us tend to think about pursuing the Lord, but there's not New Testament Bible verses that demand such behavior. Your prayer time might be in the middle of the day or the nighttime, or you might read this section of Scripture. You might read 10 chapters of Scripture. You might read 10 verses of Scripture. You might read one verse of Scripture in a quiet time. There's a ton of freedom there, isn't there? So we want to be very careful and remember that we're living in gospel freedom now. And third principle is this. We're not under man's law. We're not under man's law. I'm seeing this ugh, come into the church in lots of different forms. As I try to say, try to understand where different systems are rooted. There are some good desires here. I'm going to talk some now about uh, some some church practices. We talked in a previous podcast about ecclesial legalism. So that's that's legalism, extra laws, not in scripture that would shape, you know, the practice and, and worship of the church. Um, there is a desire to not do what unsound and worldly churches do among conservative evangelicals and the reformed crowd, at least some parts of it. But there is that button that we all tend to hit. We hit it in our own personal life when something happens that we don't like, when our spouse says something that cuts us the wrong way or a child is not polite and we hit the overreact button, right? But we also hit the overreact button in our theology and our practice and our ecclesiology. So you, you see, for example, some terrible form of, let's call it, youth group. You see a youth group done really badly where the parents aren't plugged in and there's worldly practices and worldly music. And it's kind of a really attractional ministry where it's, you know, you're just basically luring kids in with exciting pseudo worldly devices. And uh, and then you give them a little spritz of Bible and the youth pastor is is this super cool cat. And, uh, you know, he's seen basically by the parents of the church as the one who was supposed to get the kids saved. That's why they're paying his salary. And the parents aren't really doing any discipleship at home and that sort of thing and not taking their role as a father or mother seriously. And so a, a good number of folks out there have observed some kind of youth group like that. And they're really out there genuinely and truly bad youth grouping is done. Let that be said. But they hit that overreact button as well. And what can happen is then you can get to a place where you're handing down laws that are not found 
in the New Testament. You may choose out of wisdom as a church, let's say if you're a pastor, a group of pastors, and say, we don't, we're not going to have a youth group. That's valid. That's viable. You can say that. The Word of God doesn't say you have to say that. The Word of God doesn't say you can't say that. But what you don't want to do then is say you can't have a youth group because there's bad youth groups. Because the Scripture doesn't say that. If the Scripture says you shall not have youth groups, if if the New Testament teaches that, you darn sure better not have a youth group. Don't have even a whisper of it. Don't even let youth come within, you know, a country mile of each other in any kind of group setting. because. Scripture said not to do that. Honestly, we we put the line where God has the line. We draw it exactly as God draws it to the fullest extent. But what we don't do is draw lines. And I mean, in terms of handing down, this is how it must be. You cannot do this or you must do this where God has not drawn a line. And God has not drawn a line with regard to what are called youth groups. If the kids, the the students of the church want to get together and they want to play kickball and kickball is being played from 4 to 6 p.m. on a Friday night, there is no principle in the New Testament that would say that is sinful or bad or ungodly. I would tend to say wanting to honor Christian freedom and different convictions among genuinely godly believers that that can really be positive because um, it is a good thing for us to be in our family units. Absolutely. A whole lot of the time. I love time with my family. It's so valuable and so good. It's also good for kids to have friends and it's good for kids to hear good teaching and it's good for kids to have fun together. It's good for kids, by the way, to associate the church and its, and its, its doings with pleasantness and and happiness. It's it's good for our kids, not merely to learn that they got to go to church, but to actually want to go to church. You want to be careful, as I was talking about, because you don't want to make that a a worldly thing where they want to go to church only because of worldly reasons. But you you should be careful, for example, about uh, a reality like fun. The goal of going to church is not to have fun. But you could overreact and say, you, you better not have any fun at church because that's not what it's about. They may enjoy going to church. That's not a bad thing. That's actually a positive thing. And so do you have a youth group? Does scripture spell this out? Does it say that a godly church has a youth group or a godly church does not have a youth group? It doesn't say anything in either direction. Don't follow man's law. Follow the word of God. You have freedom. I'm going to guess that godly believers will probably come to some different conclusions on youth groups. And and let's even say among those who do youth group, there are going to be a lot of different ways of doing youth group. You have freedom. And and, and among those who don't do youth groups, you have freedom to get together as as families or, you know, do this kind of gathering where maybe Maybe there is more family togetherness or something, but you're letting your kids actually have fun together and that's positive. So what we don't want to do is is hand down new laws that bind the conscience where God has not bound it, that is not solid. Here's another reality along these lines. Family worship. We know from Deuteronomy 6 that in Old Covenant Israel, um, discipleship, let's call it that, wasn't a a a one hour reality in the day. It was to be an all of life reality. And that's such a joyful thing to appropriate, not as if we're under the old covenant because we're not, but as a, as a teaching truth, um, the old Testament teaching us something vital there about being a father or mother. It's, it's an all of life reality. And so the new Testament doesn't tell us We've got to have family worship six nights a week. It doesn't say you got to have it at this time. It doesn't give us a prescribed order. The New Testament teaches that the husband is head of his wife. In Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, he washes his wife with the water of the word. But the New Testament doesn't exactly set up the home as a little church and say, this is now a little church and this is how it's got to go. And you you have to have a little church service every single day. Again. We have freedom here. What is called family worship is wonderful. The the family gathering and 
reading scripture together and praying and singing. W- what a joy. My family loves to do that. I, I lead my family in doing so. And even when I'm at work, like I am now, my wife, you know, teaches the kids scripture and, and sings songs with them and plays the piano with them and wonderful things like that. And, and that's great. So we have a ton of freedom to do this. What we call family worship is a great thing. I'm so thankful that there are numerous voices out there who are encouraging men to step up and lead their homes in this regard. And I'm so glad when I hear about families uh, who, who are singing together and reading scripture together and um, the father is is speaking scripture over his family and the mother's contributing and all these kind of things. That's great. But what we don't have is a New Testament commandment that then binds us and says, this is it. This is how you do it. And if you don't do this, you're in disobedience. And honestly, you're kind of a bad Christian family. Let me give you a word of honesty here. There are weeks where between all the challenges of the schedule, between sports, between church events, um, between my teaching and speaking schedule, um, between just commitments to be together with uh, other Christians or whatever it may be, and everything else that life throws at you, <laughs> between cars breaking down, uh, between lawns needing to be mowed, um, between challenging days where kids skin their knee and are having a rough day, tons of factors. There are weeks where we definitely are not close to an every night of family worship schedule. Not even close. There are weeks where we do well to to gather once in, in terms of what would be formally called family worship. There can be seasons even for Christians where that is challenging. There can be. I need to be careful, though, because I do want to have a home where I'm living genuinely as a Christian husband and father, just to speak of my role. My wife is living as a Christian wife and mother. Our kids are in a meaningful Christian environment, and there's Christian truth being shared, and prayers being prayed, and conversations being had, and you go on walks and talk with your kids, or my son and I have a basketball game to drive to. I was an assistant basketball coach this past year for his homeschool team, and so we're we're on that hour-long drive talking about all sorts of things. We're talking about the Boston Celtics. We're talking about the goodness of watermelon gum. We're talking about discipleship. We're talking about books. Uh, lots of things, right? Uh, very much kind of a Deuteronomy 6 reality there. And and so there's, I want those rhythms of discipleship always operating in 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 my home. I pray they are. They they operate very imperfectly in the strand home. Let that be said on, under my headship. Absolutely they do. Nonetheless, that's the goal. But that doesn't reduce to one prescribed um ritual every single night, or else discipleship isn't happening. If we if we make discipleship in, in any category only happening when one structure occurs, I, I don't think we're doing justice to the freedom of Christian discipleship because the New Testament doesn't command me as a father to have a nightly worship time. Um, that's That's something that we can add in. A weekly date night. Let's move on. A few years ago, there was a lot of attention given to date night, as it's called. So if you're a, a prospering husband and wife Christians, you know, what you do is you carve out that date night. And so Friday or Saturday night, that is sacred. I remember hearing that phrase so often. That is sacred. We've got to have it. So here again, if that is your practice, if that has yielded good in your marriage, great. No um, denunciation here. No discouragement, no no word for me to say, don't have a date night. No, absolutely not. But I think even there, we can take good things that really can work well for a lot of us, let's say, and we can then make them, if we're not careful, into a new law, a new expectation, a new burden. Maybe it's not handed down as a Mount Sinai commandment, but maybe it's just, well, you know, your marriage probably really would be good if you had a date night. Well, date nights could be good. They really could be good for us, but we have to be careful. We don't want couples to think 
that their marriage hinges on a weekly date night or biweekly or monthly or whatever it is. That may be part of the rhythm of a healthy, godly marriage for a lot of Christians. Absolutely. I, I think it's, I think you could class it under wise practice, but we just don't want to take something that isn't found in scripture, isn't found in the New Testament, and thus make it an imperative. You can do that not wanting to, to trap people in a legalistic system as with these other realities. You can start out with really good motives and you can keep having good motives. You can want fathers to shepherd their wife and their children. That's a wonderful desire. You can want to protect youth from bad teaching and silliness and that sort of thing that is not godly. That's a really good thing. But you have to be careful because there's ditches on either side. And you also can take something that could be good, maybe even wise for a lot of people, and end up making a new law. I got to conclude because fourth, we are free to pursue Christ in rest. That's what we're doing. We're pursuing Christ and all the Christian life from a position, not of fearful, anxious legalism, but again, gospel freedom and here, rest. Jesus doesn't come to us and say, here we go. I got a lot I got to add to your plate. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. But, you know, I got a lot of burden to add to you. Um, you thought you were going to live free in me. But actually, um, this life is going to be um, really sad for you and really depressive and really gloomy. The work isn't finished. Um, you have to do the work. I, 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 I'm, I haven't done it. No, listen to Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How telling is that? Christian freedom doesn't mean no yoke. But it does mean that Jesus' yoke is easy. It does mean, putting some things together here, that following Jesus is, the, is walking the path not of anxious toil, but of gospel rest. This is not easy to understand for a lot of us because there is a lot for us to do, and the world is still very much fallen and there are all sorts of trials and challenges that you face and that I face. And so what we can feel as Christians is that the rest that Jesus speaks of here is very small. It's very small indeed. And there's a rest awaiting us in heaven, but we don't really have that rest in any strong form now. And sometimes we can even confine that rest to a sort of day, daily period, like uh, at this time in the week, we get some rest. There's the type of rest. In, in the Old Testament, it's the Sabbath. But, but Jesus is presenting himself here as the one who gives that rest that was associated with the Sabbath in the Old Testament. So in the New Covenant, however you understand the Sabbath, Jesus is coming to his people and he is offering us rest. He's offering us salvific rest. We don't work to save ourselves. And he's offering us ongoing spiritual rest. As a Christian, he's offering us peace. He's offering us shalom. He's offering us, in other words, every good thing in him. And so even as we do walk through a very difficult world now, in spiritual terms, we have rest. We have peace with God at every minute. And Jesus himself is powering us to eternity. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He is gentle with us. He is humble. He's lowly in heart. He's not only walking with us, but he's leading us all the way to glory. So, so that is how you live the Christian life. The truth of rest in Christ doesn't mean you lay in your bed all day. Rest in Christ is the very best foundation there is for godly activity in this world. Because you don't do frenzied deeds for a lot of different reasons as a Christian. You 
rest in the finished work of Christ as a Christian and thereby live with God's smile on your face and seek as a a well-loved child to follow your heavenly father through the power of the cross and the indwelling ministry of the spirit. That's not some Christians. That's every Christian. At every moment in the Christian life, we live out of the overflow, as I've been at pains to say in this episode and the previous one, of the finished work of Christ. Jesus is always the Savior. Jesus' cross is always effectual. Jesus' resurrection is always true. Jesus is right now ascended and at the Father's right hand, reigning and ruling over all things. And so, that foundation does not squelch godly living. It does not yield uh, sinful passivity. It is the best foundation there is for joyful, active Christianity. Are you justified by your quiet time? Absolutely not. Not even one percentage point. Do you want as a Christian genuinely saved to know God's will and know God's truth and learn God's word? Yes. Does that mean then living in freedom with not a New Testament imperative um, stalking you in that sense, but does that mean that you seek to Get wisdom about godly structure in your life so that you won't read the Bible once every 16 days for a few minutes and then check your phone endlessly. It, it does, I think, for, for, for us as Christians. What structure would God have us build in our lives to, to make sure we appropriate the word of God? That's just one area, as I've talked about. There's tons of different areas where, where the New Testament doesn't say, this is the time amount this is the precise practice. This is what it looks like exactly. That's the freedom part. But there's that structure part. All of that is anchored in the gospel. And all of that is to be pursued, not for legalistic grimness, but for our joy and God's glory. Let these truths, not from me, but from scripture, reshape your Christian life, because that is exactly what God has calibrated them to do. God bless you.